So uh, I'm the last talk between you and drinks and dinner, so I will try to blow your mind as quickly as possible and then get out of your way. Uh, some familiar faces. So one of the questions in the previous talk was, how do I get involved in this kind of really cool stuff? Uh, which is to say like compiler engineering and uh, being part of a big language project that will improve the lives of millions of people. So I can answer the first part. <laughs> this is a compiler project. And the second part, we'll talk about how to get this in front of millions of people. So uh, it's nice to be back at Geek Camp because we actually initially talked about this project like six, seven years ago at Geek Camp. And since then, I've been quietly working on this. And this is actually a good time because it turns out that a couple of years ago, the uh, UK government says they want computational law, they want computable legislation. And they posted this thing, and I'll come back to this. Uh, how do you turn this? piece of legislation into a flowchart, right? That's the sort of thing that we feel like doing. Um, and then uh, this year, the insurance giant, AXA, said, we're very interested in computable contracts. And this guy, who happens to be both a lawyer and a coder, came along and said, you know, software developers have tools that are more powerful than lawyers can even imagine. And when I'm a developer, I love my tools. When I'm a lawyer, I hate my life. But this is all a little bit like theoretical. The thing that made it really real for me was last month, my mother called me up and she said, hey, my aircon is leaking and it caused some damage in the house and we had to get it fixed and can my insurance pay for it? Can you come and read my insurance contract for me? And <laughs> she wanted me to help her in understand this clause, right? So I'll make it a little bit bigger and so you can read it and maybe you can tell me, right? Uh, what I should say to my mother. And the situation is the rats bit the insulation, there was condensation, the water dripped, and now she wanted to know, is it covered? Not covered? Not covered, however? Not covered, however, unless? <laughs> right? So, <laughs> so I will draw everybody's attention to the fact that the Ang Mo is having trouble reading the English. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> so I think if all of us are having trouble reading this, right, like a 72-year-old lady is going to have trouble reading this. And so uh, I was like, okay, <laughs> where do I, how do I respond to my mom, right? It's going to be 20 times as hard for her to understand. So, but I have a secret weapon on my side. This is what I've been spending the last six years doing. Uh, so I have been building software that is designed to solve this kind of problem. So what I did was I took the text and I reformatted it into a spreadsheet that looks like this, which, you know, more or less preserves the original information, right, but gives it a bit of structure, right? And as you can guess from these checkboxes, the big idea is to make the underlying logic interactive to the end user, right? And if you click on these things, the thing on the left will actually change. But doing formulas in the spreadsheet itself is only the first step, right? Once we have this much structure, we can actually run it through a parser, which understands the ideas of like predicate logic and Boolean algebra. And then you can get an intermediate representation that looks like this. This is Haskell. Are there any Haskell, anybody with exposure to Haskell in the room? A little bit, maybe? Okay. This will be your intro to Haskell. And you can transform this data structure to all kinds of things. Like you could turn it into a cute little visualization of the Boolean logic in the form of a circuit diagram, basically. The parallel means or, right? And series means and. And these little black bars on the right mean not. So there's kind of a circuit diagram for Boolean logic. Um, this is actually thanks to Claude Shannon at MIT 80 years ago. Some people are nodding their heads. Yeah, Claude Shannon did a lot of things. And this was his master's thesis, actually. He unified Boolean algebra with digital circuits. And this is the kind of unification, by the way, that gets your name into the history books, right? Like Claude Shannon, right, uh, did this. And then who? Unified electricity into electromagnetism. Maxwell, yes. So this guy, Maxwell, unified electricity and magnetism, right? Electricity goes this way, magnetism goes that way. <laughs> so who gave us isomorphism between proofs and programs? Curry, that's right. There's Curry and there's Howard. Curry-Howard isomorphism, right? And so, you know, it is our humble ambition to follow in these footsteps, right? Do a similar kind of unification uh, between law and logic and programming. 
Because obviously, like, once you see that spreadsheet, you're like, okay, so obviously this is what the insurance people were thinking, right? And then they turn it into English. Now we have to turn it back from English into... And so people have been thinking about the unification and the correspondences between law and logic for a very long time. This paper was from 1957, where they said, you know, hey, you know, let's use symbolic logic to draft and interpret legal documents. Right? So, and since then, people have been publishing all kinds of papers, paper after paper after paper, on the idea of computational law. And I'm going to skip past all of this academic research and come back to the rats eating my mom's aircon insulation. All right, and so as I was saying before I so rudely interrupted myself, the text goes into the spreadsheet, which goes into the data structure, which goes into the visualization, which could be at any level of detail, because now it's software and we can fiddle with it as much as we want, right? And you can also auto-generate a decision table from the logic. And if you want to go further, you can think about building a natural language generation engine that tries to create useful explanations. And we will know that it works well enough when I can just siam my mother over to ask Jamie, right? <laughs> so speaking of ask Jamie, <laughs> uh, let me show you a project that involves actual real world government regulations. It's actually not that far away from ask Jamie. And this involves the Personal Data Protection Act, right? Which is the part of the law that says if your organization experiences a data breach, you cannot just keep quiet and hope nobody notices. Uh, for example, if Sing Health manages to lose your medical records, the PM's medical records, then Singh Health is required by law to inform the Personal Data Protection Commission, and he is informed to inform the, they're required to inform the prime patient as well. And so we said, okay, it'd be interesting to encode this piece of real world legislation and turn it into a web app that businesses and individuals can use to understand their situation and their obligations under the law. So we started with 68 paragraphs with statutory and subsidiary legislation. The details are spelled out in a 70-item schedule that says what exactly counts as personal data. Uh, the PDPC's brief also includes 160 pages of advisory guidelines containing a 20-page chapter in the data breach notification obligation and a separate 40-page guide on data breaches. So can you imagine you're in the situation of like you're the chief data protection officer, which is really like one of three co-founders, and then something happens, and then now you have to like consume all of this stuff while you are panicking, right? <laughs> so our task was to convert all this material into a spreadsheet, and it took about 200, 250 lines, which captures all the details of the law, right? In the same way that the previous spreadsheet captures all the details of the insurance contract. And from this, we can get a big picture view of the legal requirements. And it's kind of nice to draw this, because we can see that even though there's this giant or clause, right? Most of the thing up here is the or clause. If you look all the way down at the bottom of the or clause, you see a short circuit available that bypasses everything else, right? So this allows us to have a really nice big picture view of the ands and the ors and the unlesses. Um, so this is, the, this is the decision logic, which is what we call the static parts, right? Physics envy. And so if you've got statics, you've got dynamics. The dynamics look like this. This is the workflow of what you're supposed to do by when, under what circumstances. And this is drawn, the formalism here is called a petri net. And if you don't know what a petri net is, you can think of it as basically a state machine, a DFA sort of thing. So we have data structure, we have control structure, right? And we say, look, law is basically a program. And from that, we can generate an actual program, a web app that the end user can use to explore their situation, right? This web app is completely generated from the upstream spreadsheet. It's pretty crude, but you can see how, you know, like if you have a bit of CSS and JavaScript, it can actually be the back end for something like an Ask Jamie, but like with much more sophistication. It can help you understand your legal situation without having to pay a lawyer, and that turns out to be useful, right? And hopefully in future my mom can go and click on this web interface and not talk to me. So, <laughs> so if I had more time, I would talk about how this is an example of like model-driven engineering. I talk about the differences between a programming language and a specification language. But I will skip to something even more interesting, which is something that our software brought to our attention, right? So let me explain the DBNO a little bit. The law says, if you think you got pwned, you have to go and investigate how bad it was. And if it turns out to be so bad that it is a notifiable data breach, then you have to tell the government as soon as possible, ASAP, which means three days. And you also have to tell the affected users that you lost their data ASP, ASAP, 
in parallel with notifying the government, right? So these are both ASAP situations. But maybe the data breach is so sensitive that the government tells you, hold on, don't notify the users yet. We need to go and do some PR because, you know, like Sing Health has gone and lost the PMs. So we need to manage the PR. Don't tell the users. And that is a problem because you told the users already. Oops, right? And programmers know that this is called a race condition, right? And so uh, it turns out that once you have the encoding, it is possible to find these kinds of issues automatically by using what's called a model checker. In our case, we use one called UPAL. And what model checkers do is basically they try to look across like every possible future, right? What is every possible way that this thing could happen? And it predicts where the errors are. Even before the acts are passed, before the contracts are signed, it can anticipate this stuff, right? And that is basically what is going on here in Avengers, right? Because he's looking across 14,605 futures. He's presumably using what's called a SAT solver or an SMT solver, right? And then he comes back with like, here's the winning strategy, right? And so this is model checking with CTL. Um, and you know, I'm, I'm gonna skip past this a little bit, uh, but we can come back to the temporal logics if we have time. But basically, he's trying to evaluate every possible feature until you get the one that wins, okay? So we write a CTL property that says we shouldn't have a situation where both some individual was informed and at the same time, notification was prohibited, right? Because those are the two conflicting things. And the system comes back with a trace that shows how the race condition could arise. In, in our language, all of this turns into basically a compiler warning for the guy who's drafting the legislation, right? You can say, look, you know, your law is a little bit broken because it's possible for the person to end up in this situation where they are obeying the law and they're breaking the law, right? And to be fair to the government, this is kind of a trivial toy example, right? The guidelines do actually address this. Um, but you can imagine more complicated situations that are harder to sort of just anticipate, right, in your head. And that is where model checking starts to be the only way to solve some of these hard problems, right? It's a bit like playing chess, playing Go, now you're playing law. And we know that humans are good at it up to a certain point, right? And so, you know, this is, this is kind of uh, useful because for those of you who are at GovTech, OGP, if you're familiar with this product called CheckFirst, which is meant to be an online eligibility checker builder, then you can think of our system as being able to automatically populate a CheckFirst application directly from the law itself so that you don't have a bunch of programmers who are more comfortable with like JavaScript and Python. You don't have a bunch of programmers pretending to be lawyers and doing statutory interpretation, right? So. In the time remaining, I want to give a very quick tour of how the software does what it does. Um, this is meant to be a compiler stock, so I will talk about the compiler toolchain. We start by manually encoding the law into the spreadsheet. The spreadsheet gets downloaded as a CSV. The parser consumes the CSV, it builds the data structure, and then you get the output, right? So this is the, the output could be all kinds of things, and here we're showing the output is the diagrams, um, but it could also be the web app, right? And so if you want to turn your legislation into Python, if you want to turn your legislation into TypeScript, we can do that, right? And it's completely automated. And then the downstream app developers can use that for something else. So BPMN, Jules, is there anyone who's like from an enterprisey kind of background who <laughs> touches BPMN and DMN? No, yeah, I, I'm sorry for people who do have to touch this stuff, but if you are into enterprise software, that's the and we can output to that, right? And so this architecture will look familiar to anyone who did, you know, a pretty good undergrad degree in computer science. You may remember this book. If you're a little bit younger, it'll look like this. If you're a little bit older, it looks like this. Uh, but for a long time, this was the standard text for teaching computer science compiler theory. But now there are new textbooks like this one. And this one in particular, I recommend because it is available for free on the web. So if you happen to have an appetite for programming languages, and you want to get an email address at python.org, right? And it's like a very obscure vanity thing. Um, then, you know, like maybe you go off and you read seven languages in seven weeks. So this one is a, like a guided tour of other programming languages that you may not know, right? And you're like, okay, I've learned seven languages in seven weeks. I get it. Now I want to try learning, uh, I want to try writing my own programming language. And that is what happened 10 years ago, right? A programmer named Jose Valim went and read this book, and then he was like, cool, I will also design a language. How hard can it be? 
And so now his language is called Elixir, and you can learn Elixir in seven more languages in seven weeks. <laughs> so like programming language is, is actually quite fun. Um, so I'll just talk through a concrete example of what our compiler tool chain looks like uh, to go from the L4 encoding to the web UI. It starts off as the spreadsheet, right? And because it's a spreadsheet, you download it as a CSV, comma separated values, right? And this is actually cheating uh, because uh, CSV has commas, right? And so once you can parse CSV, which anyone can parse CSV, the parser itself for our language doesn't need to do lexing and tokenizing, right? Like if you don't like the way we parse it, just go and move your cells around. So that's outsourced to the CSV library. Uh, because the CSV has rows and columns, the parser knows the indentation level of every token. So we get our Python style white space indentation for free because it's a spreadsheet, right? So that whole piece, we cheat. And so from that, from the in initial abstract syntax tree, the parser constructs a collection of rules, and you can see some of the legal semantics starting to take shape, right? We've got things like this party must do this thing by this time under these conditions, and it's starting to look like laws and contracts. And so the interpreter performs a bunch of graph transformations to reorganize the input, and then it is ready to be transpiled to target languages. And in this case, what I'm showing is an output of the decision logic to PureScript. And for those of you who are unfamiliar with PureScript, PureScript is basically, you've grown up as a Haskell functional programmer, maybe you've grown up with ML, OCaml, and you're like, my boss just told me to write some JavaScript, and I started, and now I feel like I need to take a bath because this is disgusting. So, <laughs> so PureScript is the answer. PureScript allows you to code in basically Haskell or OCaml and compile it directly to JavaScript, and it's, it integrates all the other stuff. So that's PureScript. And so that, is, that basically is the web application uh, that is responsible for the HTML and CSS for the user interface. And at that point, that is what the end user will see. And that's the compiler tool chain that gets you there. So all the work that we do is open source. So if you want to try it out, you can use the web UI. You can install the back end. If you are really inspired, you can send us an application because we are hiring. So you can spend two years uh, learning Haskell and learning compile theory and learning program language theory, type theory if you want. Um, so at this point, I will do a time check. I want to see if we should continue. Or should we stop? Should we take questions? Because if you want, I can give you a very quick language tutorial. Um, 25 minutes. Oh, okay. So shall we do a very quick like view of the language itself, right? Because, <laughs> okay, cool. Um, I suppose I can just click on this. Okay, so here it is. So here is a very simple uh, legal rule, right? This is kind of a toy example. Um, and it basically says, every person who walks and eats or drinks must sing, right? And this is kind of what a lot of legal rules, this is the structure, right? And you can, you can make this part really, really complicated you can make this part really, really complicated, but basically a lot of legal rules say every entity who follows these criteria must perform this action, right? And so our uh, encoding of this is exactly this thing. And you can see we've kept most of the structure, only we've just moved some of the, the Booleans around. So now it's actually a Boolean tree that has been turned on its side, and so the, the root of the tree goes to the left, but basically you can indent as much as you want to the right, and that is how you get grouping, okay? When we were building this language, we were like, okay, should we do it the way everybody else does programming languages? Um, and then we realized that like the law students and the lawyers that we know, if you say to them, please begin today's session by installing VS Code. And then after you're done installing VS Code, please go and install these plugins by pressing Command Shift P, right? And then the lawyers and law students will be like, I, I'm gonna go now, bye, thanks, right? So, <laughs> so we had to take a different approach. We thought, okay, maybe, you know, like that's too scary. Let's just do a spreadsheet. And so uh, in this rule, right, there are actually two things going on. There's the, every person who qualifies in some way must do some action, right? And so you can actually break that out. So why don't we break it out and say every person who qualifies, right? And then we're like, okay, what does qualify mean? Qualify means 
uh, walks and eats or drinks. And from this, you can uh, break out the moving parts, which is basically this. Every person who qualifies must sing. And then if they do it, then you're happy. And if they don't do it, you're in trouble, right? Uh, and the qualifying conditions are basically this circuit diagram. And the way we explain it to the lawyers is we say, here's the pond, right? And can you get from the left side of the pond to the right side of the pond by turning some of these stones green or whatever, right? And then like, as you turn the stones green, you can hop across the pond. And that's how you explain logic to lawyers. Um, so, <laughs> so this is a very simple example of uh, uh, the language. Um, here is a more sophisticated example of a this is from an academic paper where they said, okay, let's take a uh, traditional loan contract where you've got like the lender and you've got the borrower and you've got a closing date. So here, like you look at this and you're like, isn't this just like a type declaration or a class declaration, right? And it is. And you could imagine like just syntactically reshuffling this and then you've got like Python or you've got JavaScript or you've got TypeScript. It's really not that hard, right? And then here we go and define we instantiate uh, a specific variable into that class. Um, and then you start working on the moving parts. And the moving parts actually tend to look really close to uh, an actual contract where we say, so you may request funds from the lender on a certain date. And if that event happens, then the lender must send a principal uh, to the borrower within one day. And you can see that this is a, a sort of regulative rule. It's got the shape of a cross, and it nests recursively, or sort of links across, right? So you can think of this as the control structure, right? But because if then else was already taken by real programming, I'm using the term hence. So hence is kind of like your then. Roland? Uh, yes, they are. You get a choice of three. You get must, may, and shan't. And I chose the single word shan't because if you say must not, things get really fuzzy. So just shan't. <laughs> okay, so this is, they're always modal verbs and these, this is the basic syntax, right? And so you can say, okay, on this date, then you have to repay the first half. Uh, on this date, you have to repay the second half. And you can split multiple actions that you have to do both in parallel. So if you are used to thinking about questions of threading and concurrency, these are exactly the kinds of questions that contracts have to deal with because contracts are inherently multi-threaded concurrent uh, state machines. So anyway, the parser consumes all this and then poof, it gives you a petri net and you can, with some work, you can explain this to my mother and say, what has happened? This is the decision point and this is where we are today. This is the flowchart, right? They think of it as a flowchart. I think of it as a petri net, basically the same idea. So that's the, that's basically how you do the moving part. Um, you can do all kinds of things. You can take a uh, insurance contract. And so the insurance giant, AXA, came to us and said, can you try encoding this contract? Because, you know, claims processing costs like 10 to 20% of our multi-billion dollar revenue. And the problem is, like, when you call the claims hotline, right, like, hello, I am traveling and I just got my foot blown off by a mine. What am I supposed to do, right? And then they'll give you a lot of grief. No, and so basically the person on the other end of that line uh, is usually like a call center agent who has been working at the call center for two weeks and their answer is like, uh, sir, please hold. I'm going to go and read your contract. Uh, just give me five minutes. And I'm like, so the person I'm talking to is reading a contract that I already read and they're going to try and read it in five minutes and give me advice. How does this make any sense, right? Shouldn't we just like have software? And so uh, AXA was like, can, can anybody go and turn our textual uh, sample contract into some kind of formalism that we can use to drive some kind of decision engine and ask Jamie basically to run at the call center so the call center agent gives you actually the right answer. Because 
like sometimes like my reading is different from their reading, and then I'm like, okay, thank you very much. And then I hang up, and then I call again, and I get somebody else, and I keep doing that until I get the answer I want, right? Which is not doesn't feel very good. So, so this is the syntax for things like a motor insurance policy. It is meant to be like doable by someone who is reasonably technical and has had like an afternoon of training in this stuff. And at that point, if they want to go and tweak the policy, like I've had people ask me, so you know, what if there's a new constraint? How do we do that? And I'm like, well, do you know how to go and like add a new row to the spreadsheet and then you just like type it in? It's not that hard, right? And so, you know, like 90% of contract drafting is actually tweaking a contract that has already been drafted previously. Right? And so the idea is somebody who's completely cold to this language should be able to just like open it up, read it, and then find the spot that they want to change, and then make that change, they can get in and get out, and the compiler on the right will give them like error messages if they screw it up. But most of the time they should be able to just do it. So uh, these kind of output modes are the things that are intended to help people like see, oh, I could turn this into JSON, right? Um, I could turn this into Prolog. I could turn this into any other language. So this is, you know, the useful stuff that downstream applications will consume. So that's kind of the language, really. Uh, this is the RAT situation. This is the Personal Data Protection Act. This is the actual law, and you can see on the left side that these are the, the originating sort of authorities. And you know, like we had to read like four different sets of documents, 150 pages, right? And then it all just boiled down to this. And then if the end user is like, oh, you know, like, can you explain to me why exactly this thing is this? Then we can just say, well, please go and refer to the original link, and then we just send them off to that. So that's, you know, like that's the petri net. That's the decision diagram. And then if you click up here, you'll go to the web app, which may or may not load, so maybe I don't want to click. It takes a while to, to reset because it's doing a hot reload. And it's running in Vue, and then the pure script feeds into Vue as basically a config file. So hopefully it will come up. This is all being downloaded through my phone, so it's a little bit slow. But so that you can imagine how this could be potentially useful for some big organization that is trying to help users understand their rules, it's useful for governments who are trying to help citizens understand their rules, and it's useful for like entrepreneurs who are like, well, I need to draft some kind of employment agreement, some kind of funding agreement, you know, people who don't actually have the resources to hire a law firm at like $1,000 an hour, they can go and draft using our tools. So that's, that's kind of what this is about. Uh, any questions about that? Makes sense. Roland, comment. Uh, the sample insurance contract example. Yeah. You said perhaps a, an afternoon's training for the person doing the, the encoding. Uh, how long did the exercise itself take? And how many words was the original written? Uh, so we are still in the middle of that use case. And the training material is being developed. But the goal is to be able to teach a reasonably intelligent person how to do this stuff within an afternoon. To, well, to, to start drafting stuff like this, or to convert, right? And usually they'll start with a sort of cookbook approach, and they'll say, well, it's similar to this thing, I'm just going to copy and paste this. In fact, I've just taught you in like less than five minutes how to do this. I'm sure we can do it in an afternoon <laughs> for the less technical audience. Um, but it took me like about a day to actually just type this, and a lot of that was reading the contract and trying to type it in. But it tends to flow quite naturally, because law itself, Legal contracts, the text is already very stylized, right? When you read legal text, you're like, someone's trying to program. Someone's trying to program in English. <laughs> Let's give them a real language to program in. Uh, so that's, that's what this is about. Um, how much time do we have left? Shall I do like a super quick introduction to logics? Reminder, discussion? 10 minutes, OK. Well, if there are no other questions, I can give you a very, very quick intro to the logic that we use for this stuff. And so, all right, so the problem that they set, they said, can anyone 
turn this piece of logic into a flowchart, right? And this is usually the way they pose the question. And this is the kind of answer that people tend to give. They're like, well, here's my flowchart, right? And then I read this and I'm like, you know, flowcharts are not the only thing, right? The only like formal structure, visual diagram that you can use. Like, and, and these, this question was asked by the agency that developed this kind of thing, which is in like UK government, GovTech. So this is being used in the real world to develop like digital planning solutions. And my sort of response to all of this, like, I'm sorry, but you asked the wrong question, that's why you're getting all the wrong answers. Flowcharts are not appropriate. There are other kinds of diagrams, and you may not have learned them in school, but you know memes, right? And Venn diagrams show up in memes all the time, so everybody out there should know about Venn diagrams. And circuit diagrams, like you've done them in physics, hopefully, so you kind of know how to get from the left of the pond to the right of the pond. And so the kind of diagram that is appropriate in this situation is actually a Venn diagram that represents the material conditional, also known as implication. And so everything that is on the left, every Every frog that made it across the pond on the left must make it across the pond on the right, right? And that is how you explain logical implication. And this is, this is the way we would present this. We would say, look, every window which meets these criteria must meet these criteria. And this is something that you can actually recurse a little bit. Um, and if you are in the pink, you are compliant. And if you're in the white part, you're not compliant. So this is how you do reg tech. This is how you do uh, like comply tech. And so you know the way we see it, there are basically like two major kinds of rules: the kinds that are circuit diagrams, which deal with static decisions, and the kinds that are process diagrams, right? DMN and BPMN, um, circuit diagram, PetriNet. So these are more relevant formalisms, and that we would like to to sort of teach and get out there and get some exposure. So this is all fine. So now, very briefly, right, from a sort of entrepreneurial perspective, the argument is, like, when I work as a lawyer, I hate my tools, right? And people who do quantitative stuff use spreadsheets in a way that is very different from the way that lawyers use Microsoft Word, right? So, so the question is, like, what tool do lawyers and people doing legal ish functions, what tooling do they need that would help them be able to think with the tool, right? Because you're thinking with Excel in a way that you're not thinking with Word. And so, you know, there's this whole stack of software tools that people like us are very, very familiar with, right? And these aren't even the tools that are like specific to the task. They're just tools that help us do the job to deliver the tool that's specific to the task. And then if you look at legal, right, like they don't have a lot of tools. <laughs> These are the tools they got. Track changes is the most sophisticated tool available to a lawyer. And we've got all this other stuff on the left, right? So every single gap on this is a huge opportunity, right? And so what we want to do is like build this stack um, founded on actual like real logic. So not just the lambda calculus for functional programming, the mu calculus for modals, and the pi calculus for process algebras, right? And once you put all these things together, you have enough to basically consume all of law as an application domain in computer science. And then the question next is like, how do you make money on this? Because if you have the language, if you have the tooling, if you have the infrastructure, it makes it very easy for people to build apps. Now you're like, who wants to buy these apps, right? Who's actually willing to pay? That is kind of the question that two years in to this current implementation, now we're asking who might actually be willing to pay real money for something in this space, right? And so when I try and answer this question, I'm like, well, hand wavy, right? Uh, maybe there'll be a lot of people building tools that rely on the IDE, and then all the stuff in the sidebar needs to run in the back end somewhere. And after a while, if you like mid-journey, right? You're like, okay, if the sidebar is too slow for you, then come and pay the premium plan for like 10 bucks a month, and you get like better colors and better fonts or whatever, right? And so I'm like, that's maybe one answer. It's kind of an infrastructure answer. But 
I would like to think that there are other answers. The business modeling problem is that when a lot of consumers are trying to solve a legal problem, it is like a once in a lifetime thing. The stakes are really high and they're not that price sensitive. So they are willing to just hire a lawyer and let the lawyer worry about it. But there are people in enterprise, I think, who need to think about things, right? And they're not going to go to the lawyers all the time. They're just going to try and solve the problem themselves. And this is where they will turn to this kind of technology. But like, it's all still very fuzzy. And if anyone out there would be able to help us think through from the business modeling of how to build a sustainable business with all this stuff out there, I think that'd be really good. Ideologically, I think it's important because if the laws that we live under are not open right, in some way, then we're not really living under the rule of law. right? And so if we all want to continue to live under the rule of law, we should have open laws. And this is the way that we do that in the 21st century. Right? Um, I'll leave you with one final idea. So there's this thing called the ruled against perpetuity, which is something that you learn in law school. It affects how you can write wills, basically. Because if you write a will, you want to give away your house to your son. No problem. You want to give away your house to your grandson. No problem. If you want to give away your house to your great, 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 great grandson, 200 years from now, that's a problem. Because everybody is like, that's, that just seems weird, right? It's like, it happened too far ago, and we should like invalidate that kind of gift in a will. So the rule against perpetuities is intended to serve that function. And it is funny, because as I was reading this web page, I found that it is so hard for people to understand that the Supreme Court basically said, if as an attorney you don't understand the rule against perpetuity and you draft a will for a paying client, that is basically like a compile error, right? That's okay, 1961 Supreme Court. And so if law is so hard to understand that even lawyers cannot be expected to understand it, what kind of world do we really live in? And now we need to bring some software to help everybody solve these kinds of problems. Because we were able to encode the rule against perpetuities in code and it, it works, right? And you can explain, and you can see the graphics. It's not that hard once you have it in the spreadsheet. But then the question is, like, who's willing to pay for this? So that is an open question for you. And if you have any ideas, I'd be very grateful. <laughs> thank you. Wow, thank you so much. Um, so any questions from the ground? Sorry, I missed the early parts, but I'm sure with all this generative, awesome AI currently around, have you been able to, like, I don't know, it requires quite a, a neat data set, I guess, but like to go in and out of language into contracts and so on, or generate new contracts out of one sentence in English or stuff like that? Um, yeah, it's basically impossible. Uh, so, so it's like, I'd be very happy to read a poem written by GPT right, or one of these large language models, they're really good at fiction, they're really good at poetry, they're really good at like art, if you don't mind the eyes being a bit screwed up, right? <laughs> but uh, when it comes to like a contract worth like $15 million, right, or it comes to a piece of law that could see you going to jail, right, like do you really want to, do you wanna really want your lawyer to say, well, judge, I believe that my client should be considered innocent because in the last 1,000 cases, clients like him had a 98% chance of being considered innocent. Right? Uh, do you think the judge is going to buy that, right? Or the judge is going to say, well, I'm going to sentence you to five years because in the past 1,000 cases, people like you got sentenced you know, at a rate of about 75%. So you're guilty. Right? So that's, like, that's not rule of law. That's, that's emotion, really. And where we are with AI today is basically like these giant algorithms that produce these giant like regression classifiers are basically gut. They're producing emotion, reflex, and instinct, which is like sub-symbolic reasoning. And when it comes to like being arrested and going to jail, 
you want symbolic reasoning, you want rule of law, where if you disagree with it, there is some source code somewhere that you can change, right? Not let's retrain the judge and let's see what comes out this time. And does that also apply to the translation from code into spoken language? Yeah, exactly. So, like, um, the framework that we're using is called GF, Grammatical Framework. And this is a system that is designed for multilingual grammar applications. And so if you consider law to be a kind of grammar, and we have a grammar for law, uh, this will be able to output to English. And you can ask it to output to like very legalistic English or plain English, so you can tweak the dial. Uh, but all of this stuff, again, is founded in some source code with some grammar where if there's a mistake, you can file a bug report and examine where that source, where the bug is in the source and get it fixed. Right, so it's not going to be using the, the neural network type stuff. So this is kind of the opposite end of the spectrum to like an LTK, spacey, GPT-3. But we could use it to try and like do a first draft, right? So we could say, go consume all the law, and then we'll train it, and then say, produce the spreadsheet, and we'll go fix the spreadsheet. So that's a possible. Yeah, so it, it reminds me of a pattern that I saw before where we had all these amazing object-oriented and type, strongly typed languages and all this stuff in programming and then somehow the one that really conquered the world was this thing that was created in 10 days and it's wild and you can do the same thing in a million different ways called JavaScript. Uh -huh. And I feel like life optimizes for this kind of weird flaw. Um, yeah, so Absolutely. while I agree that in rule of law you would ideally want it that way, like it also extends into becoming very uh, impractical if taken to that level of complexity. Mm -hmm. um, maybe an approximation using some sort of pretty accurate AI, but <laughs> not natural. <laughs> yeah. And this is the question that I think, like the world in 2022, is asking itself: Right? Do we want to live under the rule of fairly complicated laws, or do we want to just like vote in a king? and have a populist monarch, right? And for a long time, there used to be this joke that went around. It said that every four years, America forgets that it is, in fact, a republic and tries to vote in a king. And then, like, in the last 10 years, that actually happened, right? And now we're all seeing, like, maybe that wasn't such a good thing, right? But I don't want to get too political. We're not allowed to import Western culture wars into Singapore. So... But it is a question of like emotion and populism versus rule of law and like boring European bureaucrats in Brussels. So you get to choose. I'm sort of thinking about the who who are the customers. Sort of reminded of a VS yes, Minister episode where Sir Humphrey explains that education policy is not about students, it's about teachers. And we have sort of the same issue that the, the law, I don't mean contrary to legislation, regulation is something that is socially constructed through representatives. It's clearly a state interest in uh, building that and maybe doing so in a way that's machine consumable. But it remains the case that at the other end of the machine, it's still the legal profession. Um, right. <laughs> are, are they your, your customer or your competitors? Yeah. So I think, you know, the reason we're doing this project in Singapore, among many other reasons, is that this is like the smart nation thing, right? was a big buzzword. And Singapore is the only country in the world whose PM is like a math major, right? <laughs> and a computer scientist. And we've got engineers all through the, the sort of civil service who appreciate this stuff in a way that a lot of other countries don't. So the movement around this is called Rules as Code. Um, it's had some success in places like New Zealand, Canada, uh, the, uh, UK, Australia. But Basically, the idea is like if we can turn the rules that govern our lives into software in some way so that they're understandable by individuals, right? You think that the ultimate source of authority is a judge, right? And judges are the sort of final word. And then, you know, we've given this presentation in this demo to appeal judges. And the appeal judges are like, oh, yes, we need this because the other judges below us, they're idiots. <laughs> I think yeah, I think we should catch on. I think I think this is a very interesting discussion. Um, so probably we 
uh, well, not to drag everyone here, but uh, you can continue discussions on that, right? So once again, uh, all around applause to Wing Ming. Thank you. For such an interesting talk. <laughs>